Next up is Nicole Paul. I'm really excited for this talk. I think you guys will find a lot of optimism in where technology is playing out in, um, in biology and bioengineering to cure fundamental human disease. For nearly 20 years, she's been developing next generation AAV platforms for gene repair, gene transfer, and gene editing. And she's directed evolution for novel engineered capsids and comparative multiomic approaches to interrogate translational AAV biology. She's gonna share a little bit about her work with her startup, Siren Biotechnology, which came out of stealth last year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Polk to the stage. All right, quick show of hands. How many of you have ever even heard of the phrase gene therapy or viral gene therapy before? Oh my gosh, what do you guys read in Wall Street Journal and The Economist? All right, pretty good. <laughs> Usually it's like two hands. Um, so who the heck am I and why am I up here talking to you about this? So like I said, my name is Dr. Nicole Paul. Up until like a hot minute ago, I was a professor of viral gene therapy at UCSF in San Francisco and decided to spin out a company based off some work in my lab. And I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about using viruses as medicines. So, so what is gene therapy? Broadly speaking, uh, this is using viruses as medicines. So historically, we have used these to treat single gene genetic disorders, but we can use these much more broadly now, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. But historically, we've used these when you were born either missing a gene in your genome or you had a mutation in a particular gene in your genome. And all you needed in order to be completely healthy was to have a functional copy of that gene given back to you or to have um, uh, that, the particular mutation in that gene corrected and restored for you. And we can do all of these with viruses. And so if that sounds a little bit crazy and a little bit new and a little bit revolutionary, it's because it is. We're kind of quite literally living through um, one of the most recent and kind of newest eras of modern medicine. And so in order to talk about where we are, we kind of need to understand where we came from. So nearly every one of you in this room, um, this first era of modern medicine started probably with your, either your parents or your grandparents. This was with chemical medicines. This is when we realized that, gosh, every time I have a stomach ache, I can go eat this one particular leaf from a tree, and when I eat that leaf, I feel much better. And then the scientists realized, well, we don't have to eat the leaf. We could isolate the chemical compound that comes from that leaf, and then we could produce that in mass, synthetically, in large vats in the lab, and, and that way we don't have to all go outside and, and, eat, and eat leaves all the time. Um, and so the advent of chemical medicines and realizing that we could isolate these and synthesize these in mass was an absolute transformation. This is nearly every drug you've ever taken in your life. These are all the pills you can go find at your local pharmacy, uh, particularly the ones that are over the counter, and so this is the vast majority of medicines you've ever taken in your entire life. And the way these chemical medicines work, right, you take that pillow, you swallow it, it goes into your stomach, uh, it gets dissolved by the acids in your stomach, it then gets absorbed into the bloodstream in your GI tract, and then goes throughout your entire body, and it will bind to and affect kind of the, either the shape or the function or the ability of various proteins in your body in a way that's useful to reduce your symptoms. And so then in the next kind of era of medicine, we had the, the brilliant idea, well, let's just cut out the middleman. Let's not give you a chemical that alters the shape or function of a protein. Let's just give you the protein. Let's, let's advance to protein medicines. And let's now take a protein uh, that has the particular shape and the function that you might need in order to provide some kind of therapeutic benefit for the disease state that you have and give you that as a drug. And so that's kind of been the next kind of most recent wave of modern medicine. And so this is things like enzyme treatments and antibody therapies. Uh, many of you in the room have probably heard of the most uh, successful drug of all time. Anyone know what it is? Anyone want to shout out a guess? What's the most successful drug of all time that's raised the most money? It's not Viagra, guys. <laughs> Humira, someone said it. So this is an antibody that's used to treat a particular form of arthritis. This antibody sells, on average, a little over $21 billion worth of just that drug every single year and has been the most successful drug for the last 20 years. This is what we call a blockbuster. This is what everyone is shooting for in their portfolio, is a blockbuster drug, and it's an antibody. 
But now we're entering kind of this newest, third, modern uh, form of medicine, which is what we call living medicines. This is using things like viruses, bacteria, cells, things that are quote unquote alive that we can now use to go in and impart changes in your body. Why would we do that? Well, both chemical medicines and protein medicines, we typically either give orally or we give intravenously, which means they're going to go throughout your entire body. But in some cases, we don't want a drug to go to your entire body. Like, for example, when you take chemo, boy, you feel like trash, right? It's because it's also affecting healthy cells in your body. So sometimes we want the medicine to only go into a simple place in your body or a single place, so that way you only experience the, the therapeutic effect in a single location. The other really cool thing we can do with things like viruses and cells is we can engineer, I know many of you here are like tech or tech adjacent, we can engineer in logic circuits. So we can add things like if, then, or, and, and all these types of kind of Boolean logic. We can engineer those circuits into viruses and cells and have them perform those same types of decisions uh, within your body. Like if you experience this, release the drug. If you experience this, don't. So you can engineer in these types of circuits in order to get this really, really precise delivery of any particular medicine that you're interested in delivering. And you can package almost anything in a virus. And so a really common misconception is that all viruses are bad for you. All viruses make you sick. Couldn't be farther from the truth. The vast majority of viruses on the planet are very good at getting inside of you, but very few of them make you sick. I bet most of you can't name more than 20 viruses, and all the viruses you can name are viruses that make you sick, like measles, mumps, polio, smallpox, these types of things. We only know of them, because we study them, because they make us sick. But the vast majority of the viruses on the planet can actually kind of be considered our allies. They're tools that we can use that don't make us sick, but they're still very good at getting inside of us, that we can use to deliver all kinds of medicines. So all of this is talk, much more fun to look at is an actual video of this in action. And so what I'm going to show you on this screen is a patient from a clinical trial from a patient that has a rare form of inherited genetic blindness. This is a disease called Leber's congenital amaurosis. These patients are born basically medically blind. They cannot see at birth. And you're going to see two videos. The one on the left is going to be this patient pre-treatment attempting to navigate a maze. You can see that maze on the floor at very, very low light. So the reason that this looks very yellow is because it's taken at one luminal unit or low light. All of us have much poorer visual acuity at low light than we do at high light. So it's not that this video was taken in 1980. It was just in very, very low light. That's why it looks yellow. So I'm actually going to start that video, and I'll kind of talk over this, this patient while they're going. So this patient's medically blind. They cannot see the arrows on the ground that they're being told to navigate, nor can they see the little obstacles that they're being told, like, you should step over. So they're feeling for them with their feet, just like you would if you were blind and you didn't have your walking stick. You would just kind of feel in front of you to see what was there so that you wouldn't uh, manage to trip and fall. So I'm not actually going to show you this entire video because it took this poor patient 214 seconds to attempt to navigate this eight-foot eight by eight-foot maze. And all this patient needed, they were missing a single protein in the back of their eye. All they needed was a single viral infusion for that virus to express a single protein that that patient was missing in their eye. And this is that exact same patient. Again, this was a 10-year-old, just one year after treatment. They would have been able to do this within seven days, though. They have absolutely perfect vision. So we're able to completely cure blindness. This same young patient has now gone on to get their driver's license. They are, they are walking, quite literally, they are walking amongst us, um, leading a completely normal life. So this feels crazy and revolutionary, like, oh my gosh, I hadn't heard about this. When is this, when is this coming for the rest of us and all of our indications? Soon. <laughs> Where are we now? This is a one-year-old slide. The next prospectus from Wells Fargo is expected to come out any day now. I was hoping it would come out before this talk, but it didn't. Uh, but this is the annual prospectus they put out every year of kind of the advancement of these gene therapy companies. They do this for every industry, but this is for gene therapy. So this is all of the logos of all of the companies that are working in gene therapy for various diseases. The outer rings are kind of the earliest stages of development, those phase one, phase two trials. And as you move towards the center, towards the bullseye, that's when you're FDA approved and you can sell your drug for hopefully $21 billion a year and, and be a blockbuster. But as you can see, right, there is a wave <laughs> of gene therapies coming. For e so even those few of you who didn't raise your hand earlier that you had ever heard of gene therapy before, I promise you, in your lifetime, no matter how old any of you are in this audience, in your lifetime, you are going to receive a viral gene therapy as medicine. 
So there's a particular virus, Dave mentioned it earlier, that I like to work on, this virus called AAV. Uh, and it's typically used, like what we were mentioning before, to treat rare genetic disorders. Some of the disorders that we've been able to cure are the ones shown here on this slide. And again, we've typically only done rare single gene disorders. And in my lab at UCSF and now at the company, we wanted to ask a little bit bolder question. Typically, we've only used these to treat rare genetic disorders. Could we use these to treat other indication spaces, ones with many more patients where the need is much greater and the, the benefit to humanity would be much more? So we wanted to ask a rather audacious question. Rather than having a virus that might cause cancer, could you use a virus to cure cancer? Could you actually use a virus as a medicine that could be used to treat cancer? So we've been working on this for the last seven years to try to go against conventional gene therapy. So every gene therapy on the planet, all the ones on that bullseye I just showed you on the last slide, whether they're from academia, industry, big pharma, doesn't matter, every one of those is bespoke and personalized for a single indication. So that virus that you make can only be used to treat that one disease and no other disease. And every one of those viruses takes about 10 to 15 years to develop, so this is very time intensive usually on average about two to three billion dollars, so maybe not necessarily as expensive as the gentleman who just left the stage, but a very, very expensive technology nonetheless, uh, and typically treat very, very small patient populations. The definition of a rare disease in the United States is anything that occurs in fewer than 200,000 patients a year, but most of those gene therapies are going after indications with like 100 patients, 200 patients, so very, very rare disorders. And so we wanted to go after something that would help much more of humanity, and so we wanted to ask the question, could we make a single gene therapy that could be used to treat millions of patients across a variety of indication spaces, things like cancer, where they're often very similar to one another? Could you make a universal gene therapy? Is that even a thing? And so we wanted to kind of set out on a fairly audacious project to not only bring viral gene therapy to the oncology world, but to blend it with one of the newest forms of oncology, which is this idea or this concept of immunotherapy. Many of you have maybe even heard of this before. There's a variety of different ways you can accomplish this. They all essentially work the same way, where they retrain your immune system to fight cancer. And I'm using that word retrain very purposefully. Every single one of you in this audience has a tumor. You've had a tumor every single day of your life. It's usually a single cell. You often have many of them throughout your body. Your immune system is doing what's called background cancer immunosurveillance. Your immune system is circulating throughout your body every single day, and it's actually able to detect and find and sniff out where those tumors are and get rid of them while, they're while, they, are, while they are still single cells. How do they do this? So that single tumor cell, wherever it is in your body, it sends out little chemical cues to the local environment as well as the immune system, and the healthy cells that surround that tumor are also able to detect something's weird about that guy. And they'll send a little message over to the immune system and they'll be like, come over in and do an investigation. Check him out, what's up with him? Your immune system will come over, sniff it out, and be like, yeah, I agree, something's up, something's up with him. Uh, and they'll kill that cell. And this is happening all the time, throughout your entire body. So your immune system, Right now, today, your immune system knows how to fight cancer. It's exquisite at it. So how in the heck do you ever get a baseball-sized tumor? How does that happen? It happens because that individual tumor cell, through a variety of different mechanisms, there are many ways this happens, but typically, somehow, through one or two mechanisms, it will end up basically randomly generating a mutation that will give it essentially an invisibility cloak. That invisibility cloak makes it so that those neighboring healthy cells can't detect that something's up with it, so they don't send a message to the immune system. And because it's a little bit invisible, your immune system also can't just like randomly swim by and detect it and see that something's wrong. And so because it can't be seen, it can't be destroyed, and so then it starts to grow and become your big baseball size mass, and then you become symptomatic, right? And then you go to the doctor. But you can retrain your immune system to be able to see that invisible tumor. And if you can do that, with immunotherapy, then now you've got a way to destroy a tumor that doesn't involve chemo, that doesn't involve radiation, but basically uses your own immune system to fight cancers. And so we wanted to blend the power of viral gene therapy and the precision delivery and kind of those logic circuits around like do this when you experience this, these types of things, with immunotherapy to see if we couldn't do something uh, important in the cancer space. And so we developed a platform, a variety of different universal gene therapies in my lab at UCSF, and spun those out into the company. And the name of the company is actually based off the mechanism of action here. So we can take these viruses, have them deliver a variety of different kind of cancer announcing payloads that will announce to immune system, the cancer is here. And so that way, both the cancer cell as well as the neighboring cells will basically set off the fire alarm, pull the siren, 
and let the immune system know this is where the tumor is, come in and fight it, and you'll have these three different waves of tumor killing that can happen, both with your innate and your adaptive immune system. So while we were still at UCSF, we were like, okay, we have this really cool idea, we want to try this, but we're agnostic to any particular cancer type, because again, we weren't an oncology lab, we were a viral gene therapy lab. So we went over to our colleagues at the cancer center and we're like, what's the gnarliest cancer? What's the one that nothing works? We love a challenge. Tell us something that we can work on that will be interesting. And they said, go after brain cancer. So we decided we'd start collaborating with folks at UCSF to determine a brain cancer uh, kind of path. But how do you test a drug in order to make sure it works on human brain cancer when you can't test it yet on humans because the FDA wants you to have a, a data package before you go up for your clinical trial? So the way you test it is you actually make mice with human brain cancer. So you can take brain cancer samples from humans, from biopsies and resections, transplant those into mice, they'll grow a mini human brain tumor, you can come in and now treat them with your human drug, not your mouse drug, your human drug, to test if it works, and look to see whether or not you get a response. And this is a quick little sample from three mice from a, a treatment group where you can see uh, the, those big colored blobs or the tumors in the brains of these mice. This is live, non-invasive bioluminescent imaging where the control-treated mice that receive either a control virus or just receive sterile saline have massive tumors. These mice die versus the mice that have been treated with our virus where we can completely eliminate these tumors. As you would imagine, if you can eliminate the tumors with imaging, that might just correspond to improvements in life expectancy. So this is the one and only graph that I'm showing you. Very simple. It's a survival curve. If the line is vertical, you died. If the line is horizontal, you lived. <laughs> so we can massively improve the lifespans of these animals and for all intents and purposes, cure these mice uh, of brain cancer. And we're queuing up for a clinical trial in 2025. So we're excited to start our clinical trial in 2025. And very quickly, I'm gonna share with you guys maybe like 15, three little 15 second vignettes on what else could we do with viruses. So we see a gentleman here sleeping. How many of you are short on sleep? Every one of you, raise your hands, come on. Uh, so there is a rare mutation that happens in patients, these are people walking amongst us, who have a mutation in a gene called DEC2. These patients, again, single mutation, single gene, these patients only need four hours of sleep a night to be completely rested the same way that we have uh, the need for eight to nine hours of sleep a night. You interested in getting this gene therapy? <laughs> we could do this today. We haven't yet, but we could do this today. Another example, most of us in the room are pretty probably interested in longevity. Um, we could use viruses to regenerate the tissue in, your, in all of your joints, maybe get rid of things like cellulite, viruses, brain fog, all these types of things. This is probably a few more years out, where we're probably five to 10 years out on being ready to do this, but this is absolutely coming in your lifetime. You could get a rejuvenation gene therapy. You really want to talk far out? We could talk about maybe 30 years from now. Um, we could absolutely engineer humanity to withstand life in much more drastically harsh environments. So we could alter your skin color to be able to reflect more UV light so you wouldn't get as much damage if perhaps, say, you were living on Mars. We could engineer the cells uh, in your immune or in your gut and in the bacteria that live in your gut to be able to metabolize foods that are more easily grown on a Martian environment and these types of things. So really, your imagination is the limit, so could we enhance human potential? We absolutely can. It's just a matter of are you interested and when? So, happy to discuss the future. These are exciting times. Yeah. Can you just um, help everyone understand the timing and the regulatory hurdles? Um, viral gene therapy had a moment where there were setbacks. And just share that with everyone, how that's affected, how this technology has been held back, how it's progressing now, and what timelines generally look like for getting these, uh, these uh, breakthroughs to market. Absolutely, so today, if you were to start a brand new gene therapy company, 
called Siren Biotechnology or anything else, um, and you wanted to develop a viral gene therapy and you wanted to get to clinic, you're still probably looking for that first program in like a 10 to 15 year mark. And it's not because it's gonna take you that long to run the clinical trials. It's not because it's gonna take you that long to grow up the vats of the drug. Um, it's, it's mostly gonna be a regulatory timeline. So in between each one of these clinical trials, even before you do your very first ones, I mean, we're ready today. We could start our brain cancer clinical trial today, but we're looking at 18 months of paperwork in order to file to do that first phase one, and then you need to do your data readouts. In between each one of those trials, there's this kind of massive amount of paperwork that, that goes in front of the FDA that needs to be reviewed, and there's back and forth. And so the regulatory hurdles, both from if you weren't even doing anything, you know, really drastic like those last three vignettes that I talked about, uh, is still going to be 10 to 15 years. But if you wanted to propose something like the sleep one that I mentioned that I think we'd all, <laughs> I'm certainly interested in, um, there you're probably looking at an ethical review board um, and whether or not they'd let you do something like that because that's not a disease. So fun fact, the FDA only lets you queue up clinical trials to test drugs that are for diseases. But aging is not a disease state. Wanting to sleep fewer hours is not a disease state. Insomnia is, but wanting to just sleep fewer hours and be fully rested is not a disease state. So we kind of have to get to this moment where does the FDA start changing their definition of disease? Mm. Um, do we have a new regulatory body who will review these types of things that are more like augmentations and enhancements? Um, how are we going to grapple with this as a society? Are we, are we okay with this? And, um, and let me just ask one more question. It's a, gr it's a great question you posed because there is increasing consensus that maybe we should think about aging itself as a disease, obviously, and that there's a lot of approaches now to addressing that. Um, what about the other challenges to completing the research and the trials and um, scalability, what are the bottlenecks? We've talked about, I, I've talked on our show about um, CAR T therapy and the challenge in getting manufacturing scaled up to treat enough patients each year. Even though the technology's here, it's FDA approved, those drugs are in market, we just can't make enough. Yep. What are the challenges, and, and I've heard a lot about uh, lentivirus production and all these other kind of viral vectors being 18-month delay, super bottlenecked. How bottlenecked are we in being able to do the research that you guys are doing and ultimately to get these products to market and make enough of the stuff yep. to treat patients? So the single biggest bottleneck is actually not technological at all. It's financial. It's access to capital, um, right? So these are, like I said, very, very capital intensive. The average viral gene therapy is about two to three billion dollars. So it's about three times more than making one of those chemical medicines. Um, some of that has to do with time, how long that process takes, right? Every year your company is operating. Uh, that GNA, ooh, it's expensive. Um, it adds up really fast. And so some of this is just access to capital. And there's, right, the any company, every one of us in this room that has a company, there's Depending on your sector, there's a valley of death. <laughs> um, for some of you, it's very, very early stage. For some of you, it's a little bit more later stage, but there's a valley of death where you just can't access capital before you hit this like, big de-risking milestone where the bigger checks will come in and, and private equity and those types of groups and crossover funds in your IPO. Um, so there's a valley of death for many of these early stage companies where usually either after your seed stage or your series A, but before you've got clinical trial readouts where people are very nervous to give you a really big check. So that's certainly the biggest hurdle right now and why you see many companies going under across the biotech space, regardless of if they're selling gene therapies. And then from the technological side, it's still manufacturing is just like the drumbeat. Um, being able to manufacture these things at scale continues to be a challenge. We need folks uh, who come from like the mechanical engineering and these types of backgrounds who don't historically necessarily think of biotech as uh, a place where they could apply their, their knowledge and technologies to please come over to biotech and help us make you know, new generations of bioreactors and types of things that will allow us to produce these at scale um, cleanly, cheaply, and easily. And, um, it's just not intuitive. Um, making chemicals at scale is something that we've been doing for 40 years, so we're really good at it. Genentech can make kilos of drugs in an afternoon with a robot, um, but viruses are still something like if I queue up the biggest CDMO in the world, Catalent Pharma, uh, and ask them to make us a 5,000 liter bioreactor of virus, they'll absolutely say yes, but they won't even touch it for two and a half years. Um, because I wanted to um, double click on the um, concept of making life better for people who aren't sick. Um, yeah. The Marty Seligman from the American Psychological Association actually posed this question 20 years ago, and he said, what we try to make all of psychology and psychiatry is taking depressed people and anxious people and making them less yeah. depressed and anxious. What about meaning and fulfillment for people who are content? What about more joy? 
And so when, when you look at the field, and um, it's amazing the progress you're making, and thank you for doing all that work. Aside from, hey, can we sleep less? Yep. What else is, you know, uh, do, you, do you talk about, wow, if we had the mandate to take healthy people and, and give them a gift of augmenting them, yeah. making them into superheroes almost, when we're talking about like X-Men mutations here, what are the fun things that you dream about that you could do for humanity? Could we all just have vision like hawks or? Oh, night vision is totally possible. Night vision. Yeah, easy. <laughs> Not, literally without the goggles. Yeah, that's easy. I mean, a world in which <laughs> that's we... just an FDA. Like, I need a, I need the green light, but no, that's easy. <laughs> so okay, that feels like <laughs> Professor X kind of level <laughs> shit. I like it. Bit. What else you got? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Um, night vision would be possible, the ability to metabolize um, you know, a food that grows perhaps in a different environment that not only you can't get any nutrients from, but you can't even absorb it. Um, so we could make it so that you could you know, pretend, pretend Soylent tasted good. Um, you, know, uh, you could eat anything, and not only could it taste good to you, but it could provide you all the nutrients that you need uh, and be able to grow with you know, much, less, much less water and in the types of environments that we'll have in, in the future planet, that, you know, given the climate change challenges that we all have. Um, as far as other augmentations, I mean, there's, there's all of the obvious beauty applications uh, that I think all of us are already doing. Uh, now this, we'd just be doing this with a different modality, right? So removing, you know, there's a, there's a gene therapy company in San Diego working on male pattern baldness. Uh, there are folks working on, you know, all the wrinkles and cellulite and, you know, getting your hair color back and, like, all of the normal beauty things that you would expect. That's absolutely coming. But as far as beyond the obvious beauty things, like what other types of augmentations, I think the mental health space is a huge one because um, it's, it's usually a very, very simple thing. I mean, it's complex, but it's simple. They're usually missing a single receptor or a single protein somewhere in their brain, and if we were just able to restore that for them in just that location and not everywhere in their body, um, you could restore joy. You could restore happiness. All of these wow. types of things. That's fascinating. Can, do you want to talk about the capital markets piece? Because you, you mentioned you need capital. Yeah, we're fundraising. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Tomorrow, maybe, maybe, maybe you can um, help out here, but you know, the biotech market's been decimated oh, yeah. since November of 21, and uh, it's really intricately linked to interest rates because of how far out you have to make a bet on a biotech company, and so as a result, the valuations have plummeted 80%, 90% in many cases, and a lot of stuff's just not getting funded right now. Yep. Um, maybe, Chamak, you can share your point of view on where things are headed there. And um, Nicole, maybe you can share a little bit about what the experience has been fundraising, even though you have a great technology that's got some proof points, how hard it well, is. Well, I, I, I have a kind of a technical question, but which is just, you had to, when you picked AAV, you had to make a decision about small edits and not large edits, I guess, right? So just explain to these guys about what payloads are actually possible in AAV, and are you thinking about what happens if you actually have to go beyond 4 KB, and how are you going to solve that? So, so because every, a lot of the diseases yeah. that these guys will actually probably understand are not small SNPs. They're going to be large, you know, so cut and paste. two types of gene therapy. There's gene transfer gene therapy, where we give you the whole gene that you were missing, like perhaps you were missing that portion of your chromosome at birth. So that's gene transfer gene therapy. We're literally transferring a functional copy of the gene back to you. And then there's gene editing gene therapy, where we go in and actually correct a mutation in place uh, within your genome and don't give you anything extra. So every virus on the planet has a carrying capacity. It has a size, just like a sedan can't carry as much as a minivan. Um, and so AAV viruses, the viruses that I work on, are amongst one of the smaller viruses. So it can only package about 4.75 KB. So the numbers of nucleotides that you can fit inside of it, and different viruses have larger packaging capacities and can fit more stuff. That's, that's 4,700 letters of DNA. Yeah. Um, and so different viruses will have different packaging capacities. And so if you're doing gene transfer gene therapy, where you need to provide the entire copy of the gene, you can only put in genes that will fit with all of the other regulatory elements for expression within that virus. So of all protein coding genes, since we're typically going after diseases that are in influencing a protein, of all protein coding genes, 80% of those genes can fit within my virus. So actually the vast majority of genetic diseases can be treated with AAV gene therapy, with gene transfer gene therapy. With gene editing gene therapy, we can treat anything because now it's, we're not size limited. We only need to deliver either the nicker or the cutter, right? Many of you have heard of things like CRISPR. That's one of the many tools we can use to nick or cut DNA. Uh, and we can either make a nick and have your body repair the mutation, 
we can go in and make a nick or a cut and we can cut something out that wasn't supposed to be there or we can go in and nick or cut something in your genome, cut something out and then put something that was meant to be there the whole time back in. All three of those forms, those gene repairs and gene edits are all kind of broadly classified as, lot of, as gene editing gene therapy and all of those would fit within a lot any of, virus. There's a high percentage of disease, I don't know the percentage, you probably know, which is really just like one point mutation, right? Yeah. Huge Transcribe number. AC or something yeah. is typically the biggest one, right? Can you just explain to folks in when you think the tool chain will exist for us to do those single point edits and actually just... Oh, today. You can actually go in and accurately re rewrite an A to a C? Hey, today. There's a, yeah, there's a few in yeah, there's some, trials there's some and almost approved. Today. Yeah. Um, guys, we got to wrap, and I want to uh, really thank uh, Dr. Nicole Polk for her amazing work um, and for joining us here today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got a nice standing with it.